Terrific. Well, hey, thanks so much for being here this morning. It's great to be here with you. I'm Jim Howard. I'm in private practice here in the Salt Lake area. We've got offices in Provo and Layton and Logan, as well as our main office at the Intermountain Medical Center in Murray. So today we're talking about lasers, endophthalmitis, and vitrectomy surgery. And so we'll start off by talking about posterior segment laser. So there are a number of different types of posterior segment laser. One is photocoagulation, another is transpupillary thermotherapy, and then photodynamic therapy. And it's interesting just as things have evolved with kind of the takeover of anti-VEGF therapy, it's interesting to see how laser treatment has gone. Do you guys feel like there's been a decrease in the amount of laser treatment used in your clinics? Have you guys noticed that, or have you not been around long enough to maybe appreciate that? <laughs> Okay. Do you still get to do some focal laser treatment? They come in, and, yeah, but so, so often we're just doing anti and then kind of jumping into focal, yeah, so. Yeah. How about panretinal photocoagulation? Are you guys still doing very much panretinal photocoagulation? All right. How about transpupillary thermotherapy? Have you ever worked with any of the doctors who do that? Okay. How about photodynamic therapy? Do you, any of you use that? Or have you seen it done? Sometimes send people for it from the VA. Yeah. Okay. Well, sounds good. So just there are a few principles uh, to kind of keep in mind here. So coagulative necrosis occurs at 149 degrees Fahrenheit, 65 degrees Celsius. And really it's dependent on the intensity and duration of the laser treatment, much more so than the wavelength used. So there are a variety of wavelengths that we use for laser treatment. But the actual volume of photocoagulation is much more correlated with the duration the time that you spend doing the laser treatment as well as the intensity of the laser. So we'll go over some of the indications for treatment. We'll talk about delivery systems, choice of wavelength or color, power and duration, anesthesia, lens selection, and then discuss some of the pitfalls and complications of laser treatment. So here are some of the indications. So there's panretinal photocoagulation for neovascularization, either neovascularization in the posterior segment or neovascular glaucoma. Now you guys are kind of fortunate to live in a world where we have anti-VEGF therapy, and I don't know if you realize this, but back in the olden days when I started my residency in 2001, if we had somebody who came in with a central retinal vein occlusion with neovascular glaucoma, often their pupil was bound down, there was a lot of hemorrhage in the eye, and then we would try to get laser into the eye, and so we'd block the eye, and it felt like a little bit of a medieval torture type of chamber, but we were in there trying to put panretinal photocoagulation into the eye through a really small constricted bound down pupil, and we just tried to get as much as we could in, often in the setting of a very poor view. And these days, we typically give them an anti-VEGF injection, and the, ne the neovascularization then regresses, and within you know, a couple of weeks or a few weeks, the view starts to clear up, and then you can do panretinal photocoagulation later. But like I say, going back 15, 16 years, that wasn't an option for us because we didn't have anti-VEGF treatment at that time. Uh, other things that you can use laser for are focal laser treatment for macular edema, closure of ma microaneurysms or telangiectasia associated with Coats disease, creation of chorioretinal adhesion in the setting of retinal breaks or retinal detachment, focal ablation of extrafoveal crotal neovascularization, this may be something that you'll never see in your training. I, I haven't done one of these for years and years and years, but this used to be the standard under the uh, macular photocoagulation study. This was the gold standard up until about 2000, where that's the way extrafoveal and even juxtafoveal crotal neovascular membra membranes were treated. Uh, other things like central serous chorioretinopathy and tumors can also be treated with laser. So there are a number of different delivery systems. One is traditional laser treatment, uh, you know, argon or diode or uh, krypton, whatever wavelength you're using, that's considered to be a traditional type of laser treatment. You can also use an array applicator like the Pascal laser. Do you have a Pascal laser here? Have any of you used the Pascal laser? Yeah, so that's kind of nice. You hit the button and all of a sudden, you know, you've got 200 spots of laser or something like that. So that's a pretty slick deal. It's a lot easier, a lot quicker than doing single spots of laser. The other thing that's kind of come on the scene recently is this micropulse laser treatment. And uh, do any of you have experience with micropulse laser treatment? Have you seen that used? Do you have a micropulse laser here at the university or at the VA? You do have micropulse laser? 
All right, so micropulse laser is relatively new within just the last few years. And the concept behind micropulse laser is that you're using an infrared wavelength, so you're using an 810 nanometer wavelength. And it's got a duty cycle, so it's on part of the time and then off part of the time. So it's on about 15% of the time. And the concept behind this is that with the off period, there's a chance for the heat and energy to di dissipate. It's, and so as a result, you get less damage to the photoreceptor cells. The energy is concentrated in the RPE where you want it, and you don't get as much burn or energy uptake by the photoreceptor cells, so you sort of spare the photoreceptor cells. And there are a few different companies, or at least a couple of different companies, that have worked on this quite a bit. Iridex has worked on it a lot, as has this uh, other company, Optos. So this is something that you can get for your office. And you know, truth be told, I think that if this would have come out 15 years ago, people would have, would have just absolutely loved it and would have taken off. The reality is, is that where laser treatment is gone, we don't use laser treatment as much anymore, so people, people are less willing to go out and spend forty to $70,000 or more on a laser for something that they're hardly ever going to use. And when you look at the business dynamics of a practice, a private practice, or even in the university <coughs> setting, sometimes it's hard to justify that sort of expenditure if you're hardly ever going to use it. The other thing that's happened, too, is that reimbursement for laser treatment has gone down. And so, like I say, looking at the business aspect of this, if the reimbursement is declining and you're hardly ever using it, again, it's a little hard to justify buying some things like this that are a little bit more expensive. There's another way to do it. You can put the indirect ophthalmoscope on your head with the laser treatment and you can treat retinal tears, retinal breaks, um, retinal detachments. Endophotocoagulation is something that we use frequently in vitrectomy surgery. So in diabetic cases or central retinal vein occlusions, branch retinal vein occlusions, retinal detachments, endophotocoagulation has become a really important part of this. Does anybody know when and where endophotocoagulation was developed? Well, it was developed here at the University of Utah. Um, or at least some of the original concepts uh, going into endophotocoagulation were developed here at the University of Utah. So my partner, Mano Swartz, was a professor here for a long time at the University of Utah and was instrumental in developing endophotocoagulation because back in the day when vitrectomy surgery was first getting off the ground, that wasn't an option. And so you had to use indirect laser or something like that to be able to treat the retina and endophotocoagulation didn't exist at that point in time. Uh, transscleral application of laser is another possibility too. You can use this for neovascular glaucoma and uh, in particular with cyclophotocoagulation. And do you guys do this as part of your glaucoma rotation? <coughs> Have you seen any of this in uh, cyclophotocoagulation? Where you turn up the laser a little bit to the ciliary body pops and then you keep going. So. Yeah, when you hear that little pop, you know you've got just the right amount of laser treatment. So this is actually a, a useful adjunct in cases of you know, poor vision potential and somebody who's got raging neovascular glaucoma, pain in the eye and things like that. It's better than having to remove the eye or inject retrobulbar alcohol or something like that. So uh, laser is absorbed by different things in different ways. So melanin in the choroid absorbs green, yellow, red and infrared laser. Macular xanthophyll is, uh, will absorb blue laser, but doesn't usually absorb yellow or red very well. And then hemoglobin will absorb blue, green, or yellow, but has minimal absorption of red. One of the reasons that that last point is important with hemoglobin is that if you're doing laser treatment and trying to get through blood in the eye, using red laser treatment is often a little bit better than using blue, green, or yellow because you can shoot through the blood a little bit more effectively and get to the retina and choroid where you want it to be. There are a variety of wavelengths that we use. Really, for our intents and purposes in our clinics, we usually use 532 nanometer green laser treatment. There's also yellow laser treatment, which a lot of people will use for macular work or use it for doing, um, uh, hitting microaneurysms and that sort of thing in the macula. Red laser treatment can be beneficial, like we talked about, in penetrating vitreous hemorrhage and sometimes dense cataracts. It uh, also is minimal, minimally absorbed by xanthophyll, so sometimes it's thought to be a little bit better for treatment of curdle neovascularization adjacent to the fovea. Again, this is something that's just not done that much anymore, so you probably won't see that. And then infrared laser treatment, as we discussed, is used for micropulse laser and a couple of other applications. So here's some sample uh, settings for laser treatment. Pan-retinal photocoagulation, 
you start usually with about 250 milliwatts of power, a spot size of about 400 microns, a duration of 0.1 second. For focal laser treatment, you want to be a little bit ginger with this because you're starting right at the macula, and usually I go to kind of a safer spot in the macula, so to speak. You don't want to treat something that's right around the fovea initially with a high laser power because if you break through Brooks membrane, you can cause crudal neovascularization. Furthermore, if you cause a bad laser burn in or adjacent to the fovea, then that results in significant vision deficits for the patient. So you usually want to go to kind of a safer spot in the macula, like the inferior temporal macula or something, and test out your laser power. But a power of 80 milliwatts is usually a pretty reasonable power to start with. You'd start with a spot size of 50 to 100 um, microns and then have a duration of 1, 0.1 second. MPS style thermal laser is kind of gone out of vogue. Uh, like I said, this is probably something that you won't ever see in your training. But uh, usually you start with a power of 200 milliwatts, spot size of 200 microns and a duration of 0.2 seconds. And then for laser demarcation, I usually start with about 300 milliwatts with a duration of 0.1 seconds. With Pascal, one of the things we did learn with the Pascal laser is that if you decrease the duration of the laser and maybe do it a little bit less than 0.1 seconds, sometimes it's a little less painful for the patient. So if you go with a little higher power, a little lower duration of the laser, sometimes it's a little less painful and is just a little, makes it a little bit easier on them. Um, there are a number of different ways you can anesthetize the eye for laser treatment. There's topical, laser, uh, topical anesthetics that you can use to anesthetize the eye. There's peripul peribulbar and subconjunctival. I really like subconjunctival when it comes to demarcation of retinal tears. I usually use 2% lidocaine without epinephrine for this. And if you give just a little bit of subconjunctival anesthetic right in the area where you're going to do the laser demarcation, it makes it pretty comfortable for the patient. Also, it makes it so that you don't have to necessarily do a retrobulbar block. And the tough thing about having a retrobulbar block is then usually you feel obligated to patch the eye so that their cornea doesn't get abraded and so forth. And so usually doing a little bit of subconjunctival lidocaine is a slick way to go and gives the patient quicker vision recovery and doesn't make it so that you need to patch the eye. Um, a retrobulbar anesthetic can be useful if you're doing really extensive panretinal photocoagulation or extensive laser demarcation. Having hyaluronidase is really helpful when there have been shortages and we've had to do retrobulbar blocks without hyaluronidase. I always notice the difference. It just diffuses better and gets around better if you have hyaluronidase in your block. You can use 2% lidocaine for that or bupivacaine 0.75% or you can use a combination of the two and some people kind of like the combination of lidocaine and bupivacaine in the retrobulbar blocks. Um, there are a couple of different types of lenses that you can use at the slit lamp for doing panretinal photocoagulation or focal laser treatment. The negative power plano concave lenses provide an upright image with high resolution, but they have a very narrow field of view. And so they're good for focal laser treatment of the macula where you're trying to be very precise and you're trying to hit microaneurysms or do a grid laser treatment. You can also use um, high plus power lenses for panretinal photocoagulation laser. This does provide an inverted image it's lower resolution, but it does give you a nice wide field of view. And of course, this doesn't have to be quite as precise because you're lasering in the mid and far peripheral retina. These are just different magnifications that you get with the different types of lenses. So these are focal laser lenses, the Goldman 3 mirror, the Yanuzi lens, the Arius Centralis. And this tells you what the optical magnification is as well as the laser spot magnification. Panretinal photo pan -retinal photocoagulation lenses include the quadrospheric, the superquad, and the rodent stock. And there are others as well. But they usually decrease your optical magnification but increase your laser spot size. So kind of a general rule of thumb to use is that they'll essentially double your laser spot size. So if you want to have a 400 micron laser spot, usually you start with a 200 setting on your, on your laser and that will give you a 400 micron laser spot size. Um, here are some of the complications or pitfalls, problems that can occur with laser treatments. So one is accidental foveal burns. This can be a really bad one because you can't take it back. There's no way to really fix that. Sometimes you can get Brooks membrane rupture, which is where you pop through Brooks membrane and you can either get subretinal hemorrhage or you can get vitreous hemorrhage as a result of this. You can also get coronal neovascularization. So in the macula, this is a really big thing. It's a big deal if you pop through Brooks membrane. Whereas if you do it in the retinal periphery, it's not as big of a deal. And sometimes this just happens as you're lasering along. Sometimes you'll hit a spot of vitreous hemorrhage. You'll crank up the laser a little bit to be able to get through the hemorrhage. 
and then you'll get to a spot where the hemorrhage is a little less dense and boom, you'll pop through Brooks membrane. Like I say, as long as this is in the retinal periphery, it's not that big of a deal and usually doesn't cause any problems. I usually kind of take extra care to surround that area with some laser spots just in the event that there's a hole in the retina or in the event that there's some subretinal hemorrhage or the potential for crudal neovascularization, it's nice to isolate that area and wall it off. But like I say, to me that's not that big of a deal as long as it happens in the retinal periphery. You don't want to break through Brooks membrane in the macula. Um, you can also use, uh, one of the, the concerns is retinal lesions like retinal holes or fibrosis or hemorrhage can result from laser treatment. Uh, Choroidal lesions like atrophy of the RPE, and this is one of the things we used to see when we did a lot of focal laser treatment for diabetic retinopathy, is we'd do focal laser treatment, there'd be kind of this phenomenon known as scar creep, and the laser scar would gradually get bigger and bigger to where it would start to encroach on the fovea, or sometimes the laser spots would become confluent. So you'd see somebody come in and they'd have just a little spot of their fovea remaining, and then they'd have you know, a lot of confluent laser treatment right around the fovea, which is a bad thing. It's almost like having retinitis pigmentosa with just having a few little foveal cells <laughs> preserved. Exudative retinal detachment and choroidal detachment are problems that can arise if you do a lot of heavy laser treatment. So if you do a lot of laser demarcation in the periphery, or if you do um, heavy pen retinal photocoagulation, you can also get serious choroidal, uh, serious retinal detachment or sometimes choroidal detachment as well. So these are things that you've got to be kind of cognizant of is that there can be problems or complications that can arise with this sort of treatment. Now, typically corticosteroids are helpful and inflammation usually peaks after just a couple of days and then spontaneously resolves. So this is a problem that will usually go away on its own. The one other thing that I didn't put down on here but that is worth mentioning is have you ever heard of crunch syndrome? Does that ring a bell for anybody? So crunch syndrome is where you do massive pen retinal photocoagulation or anti-VEGF therapy in a patient who's diabetic. And if they've got a lot of membranes in the posterior pole or in the mid-peripheral retina, sometimes those membranes will contract very abruptly, very suddenly, and it will kind of bring the retina in on itself, almost in a napkin ring-like configuration, causing a tractional retinal detachment of the posterior pole and mid-periphery. This can be a big deal and a real challenge to deal with. I've only seen it once in the setting of pan retinal photocoagulation but if somebody has extensive membranes in the posterior pole and you're just trying to get started with pan retinal photocoagulation, sometimes it's better to split it up into sessions rather than hitting them with like 1,400 laser spots all at once. Uh, Transpupillary thermotherapy. So I don't own one of these lasers. I don't think they're very useful, but it's in your textbook and probably something just worth mentioning. So it's not very useful for choroidal neovascularization. Some people like it for choroidal melanoma. Um, some people used it as standalone treatment for relatively flat, minimally elevated tumors. And so one of the techniques that can be used is the sandwich technique where you use transpupillary thermotherapy. And so you hit it from the retinal side and then you do a plaque on the other side. So you're kind of killing the tumor from both sides. One of the concerns about standalone treatment is that sometimes if you use transpupillary thermotherapy as a standalone treatment, you can develop kind of this fibrotic, dead, plaque on top of the tumor, but you can continue to have growth underneath that fibrotic, fibrotic dead plaque. And sometimes you'll actually get extrascleral extension of the tumor as a result of that. So you think the tumor's dead, and from your view, looking inside of the eye, the tumor looks dead and regressed, but they can develop tumor growth in the opposite direction that goes through the sclera and gets out of the eye that way. So I think there's caution that is uh, appropriate, or you should, ought to treat this appropriately cautiously in uh, treating tumors with transpupillary thermotherapy. Um, these are just the specifics. It's an infrared wavelength and the beam size and so forth. But like I say, I, I don't have this sort of laser. I only know of one group in the Salt Lake area that has this sort of laser, so I don't think many people are using it at this point in time. Photodynamic therapy. Does anybody know how this works or has anybody seen how this works? So you inject some dye, you inject visudine, and you have to do this compl or the somewhat complex calculation of how much the patient weighs and their skin surface area and so forth. And then you inject the visudine dye, and then after, um, after 15 minutes, you hit that area with a red laser treatment for 82 seconds. And what that does is it creates reactive oxygen species. And those reactive oxygen species essentially create 
little blood clots or thrombosis within the capillary beds of the crudal neovascularization. And in theory, that way kills the crudal neovascularization. This is, was kind of the standard for treatment of exudative macular degeneration between 2000 and 2005. And then once anti-VEGF therapy came along in 2005, photodynamic therapy kind of fell by the wayside a little bit. We still use it sometimes. So there's some patients who, you know, for whatever reason, they don't like the injections or they want to have fewer injections. So as a result, we'll try to do photodynamic therapy to decrease the overall number of injections that they require to keep their crotal neovascularization under control. The other thing is sometimes in patients with sort of poor vision potential, but with a desire to control the crotal neovascularization, you could do photodynamic therapy. Um, some of the complications or potential complications or side effects of photodynamic therapy is it creates photosensitivity. So people who have photodynamic therapy will want to cover up really well as they're leaving the building. So you want to make sure that they bring a hat and gloves and a you know, long sleeve shirt to the visit so that they don't get sunburned. I've had patients where they've gone home, stuck their finger or hands outside the window and gotten a bad second degree burn as a result of sticking their hand outside the window on their way home from photodynamic therapy. It usually lasts for about 48 hours, so it's something to just kind of keep in mind as you're doing this. Another thing that can occur is patients can get backside or chest pain. This happens in about 2.5%. And then there's also a small risk of severe vision loss within seven days of treatment. This doesn't happen very often, but it's somewhere in the range of 0.7 to 2.2%. So it's something to caution patients about and just make sure that they understand the risk before you go ahead with this sort of treatment. Um, the next topic that we're going to cover is vitreoretinal surgery. Any questions or comments about lasers to this point? You know, it's interesting. I think that probably the way you're seeing ophthalmology uh, in your training and the way things are evolving, you're probably not seeing a lot of laser treatment. It's one last comment about this is that I was at the, the investigators meeting for DRCR protocol T when they announced the results at the Academy a, a couple of years ago. And, and uh, Lee Jampal, who's at Northwestern University in Chicago, who's one of the more preeminent uh, retina specialists in the United States, said as part of this meeting, as the, uh, the results were being announced, he said, well, it might be time for everybody to just throw away their lasers. And uh, I don't know that we're quite to that point yet, but the, I, I think that he was onto something there and that <laughs> we might not need laser treatment as much in the future. And certainly I think that the, the number of laser treatments that you're seeing in your clinics and your training that I'm seeing in my clinics has gone down fairly dramatically. So the next thing is vitreoretinal surgery. And so this is a, I love this topic. This is great, I love doing surgery. So Helmholtz developed the first ophthalmoscope in 1850 and then Jules Gonen came up with this um, surgical technique called ignipuncture in 1919 where they would use diathermy externally on the globe to create a little bit of irritation and that diathermy would go into the choroid and retina and then he'd have patients lay on their side so that the retinal detachment was dependent and then the retinal detachment would settle down over this irritated area of choroid and eventually re-adhere and it would often fix retinal detachments. But that's before we had scleral buckles and vitrectomy so there wasn't really another good way of repairing retinal detachments at that time. In 1949, Custodus developed scleral buckling, and then in 1955, open sky vitrectomy uh, was developed. But as you can imagine, with open sky vitrectomy, there could potentially be a number of problems, one of which would be suprachoroidal hemorrhage, which is absolutely disastrous and can end the surgery very quickly in a bad way. In 1959, Dr. Haruda began publishing on closed system vitrectomy, but it wasn't re really perfected at that point in time. And then Dr. Mockamer, Bob Mockamer, came along. And Dr. Mockamer was born in Germany in 1933, and he helped pay for his way through medical school by working in a machine shop. So he developed all of this exper expertise with uh, machining precision tools. And so in 1966, he received a two-year NATO fellowship and went to the University of Miami to the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. And there began developing or experimenting with closed vitrectomy s systems. And, and as I understand it, he did a lot of the work in his garage. He'd go out to the, his garage at night and experiment in machining tools and vitrectomy systems that could be used inside of the eye. Uh, so another great thing that was developed in somebody's garage. Um, but this is Bob Mockamer. He used to say that progress comes from doing the unconventional. 
One of my attendings, Karen Gears at the University of Iowa, was trained by Bob Mockamer, so I kind of view myself as a grandchild of Bob Mockamer, but he's one of my heroes just for the sort of guts and gumption and daring that he showed in developing vitrectomy surgery. So in 1971, he had perfected, or not perfected, but he had gotten to the point where he had this machine called the VISC uh, vitrectomy unit, which stood for Vitreous Infusion Suction Cutter. And this thing was pretty big. It was a 19 gauge single port vitrectomy system. And so it was, it was really big. But to this point in time, there's no way to safely remove the vitreous inside of the eye in a reliable, reproducible way. And so as a result, if somebody had vitreous hemorrhage or a complex retinal detachment, scar tissue in the eye or something like that, there's just nothing that could be done. Those patients lost their vision. And so here's a picture of one of the early surgeries, and this is the visc cutter that they would insert into the eye. And you look how big that incision is. And here's an early video of the visc cutter being used. So uh, this is 1972. And this is inserting this 19 gauge cutter into the eye. And the thing that's interesting about this is that, that initially the cut rate was really low. You know, it was like a handful of cuts per minute. And uh, they improved that, it got a lot better. But in today's world, you know, 5,000, 7,500 cuts per minute is a really common number of cuts per minute. But here you can see the vitrectomy cutter inside of the eye, just gradually cutting and chomping away at the vitreous. But can you, you can imagine how much traction that would put on the peripheral retina by having suction like that as well as a slow cut rate. So in 1975, O'Malley and Heinz introduced three-port, 20-gauge parse plate of vitrectomy, which was the gold standard for about three decades. And then about 15 years ago, Dr. Fuji introduced 25-gauge parse plate of vitrectomy, but the instruments were a little bit flimsy and flexible, and so as a result, you put the instruments into the eye and you try to manipulate the globe or turn the globe, and the instruments were bent, would bend. And so, Klaus Eckert in 2003 introduced 23 gauge vitrectomy, which was thought to be kind of a nice compromise between 20 gauge vitrectomy and 25 gauge vitrectomy. And then in 2010, 27 gauge vitrectomy was introduced. And so these are the different types of vitrectomy cutters. You can see 20 gauge all the way up to 27 gauge. And these are the incision sizes that are required to put these instruments into the eye. So, with 20, 20 gauge, it was, it's a, well, it was a one millimeter incision that we had to make to get into the eye. With a 27 gauge, it's only a 0.4 millimeter incision. The thing that's interesting, so I did my fellowship from 2005 to 2007, so I finished my fellowship 10 years ago. From 2005 to 2007 at the University of Iowa, we were still using almost all 20 gauge. By the time I'd finished my fellowship, I'd really only done a handful of 23 and 25 gauge vitrectomy. And then I got into private practice and that transition became much more complete where we went to almost all 23 and 25 gauge vitrectomy. In today's world, hardly anybody uses 20 gauge vitrectomy. So as you guys rotate through your retina rotations or do retina fellowships, you'll probably hardly ever see 20 gauge vitrectomy done. But 20 gauge vitrectomy was a little tough on people. We had to suture the ports with vicral suture and then we'd usually close the conjunctiva with either plain gut suture or vicral suture. But by the end of the surgery, when the patient would have anywhere from six to nine or 10 sutures in the eye. And so the eye was really red and inflamed and uncomfortable. And in fact, I remember when I was an intern here in 2001, in the fall of 2001, on the, over the weekend, I saw one of Paul Bernstein's post-ops that came in. She was having some trouble. So as the dutiful intern, I came in to see this post-op to see what she looked like. And I think it was a dropped nucleus and Paul Bernstein had done this surgery to go in and remove this dropped nucleus and anyway I looked at the eye and I just couldn't believe how bloody and beat up this eye looked. I thought how can anybody ever do this sort of thing to an eye? It just looked atrocious. But uh, after you know having gone through residency and fellowship I just realized that that's what vitrectomized eyes look like. And, and now in today's world you know especially if you do a 25 or 27 gauge vitrectomy sometimes it doesn't look any worse than a, a cataract surgery eye. So it's gotten a lot better with time. Here are the, ads, or the advantages and disadvantages of small gauge parse plane of vitrectomy. So it decreases your operative time. As you can imagine, if you're not making big sclerotomies and not having to suture them at the end of the case, then it's a lot quicker, it's a lot faster, it doesn't require as much time. Patients are a lot more comfortable because you're not putting 10 sutures in the eye by the end of the surgery. 
There's faster vision recovery because one of the things is when you're really tightly suturing down sclerotomy incisions, 20 gauge uh, sclerotomy incisions, sometimes you would induce astigmatism, especially if you're cranking in the sutures and putting in really tight sutures, it would induce astigmatism. So as a result, it would sometimes take, sometimes take weeks or months for those sutures to dissolve and for the eye to rebound to its normal shape. And so vision recoveries are much quicker, much faster. Uh, some of the disadvantages, and this is probably the main disadvantage, is dealing with postoperative hypotony. And this really has to do with uh, appropriate wound construction. So if you do a beveled incision to the eye, it usually works better than putting a straight incision into the eye, except with 27 gauge. With 27 gauge, most people just put it right in. But with 25 and 23 gauge, usually if you use a beveled incision, it decreases the risk of postoperative hypotony. And part of the reason for that is you create a little flap and then the pressure that's within the eye pushes on that flap and closes the incision. Um, some of the risks or disadvantages of small gauge vitrectomy surgery. Initially, Ingrid Scott at Baskin Palmer published a series of <laughs> patients who had had small gauge vitrectomy in 2008, and they, she showed a pretty significantly increased risk of endophthalmitis. Well, it's interesting because those patients were, I think it was from 2005 to 2007 that those patients had had surgery. And then she went back and, and did another series that was from like 2008 to 2011. And in that second series, they found absolutely no difference in the risk of endophthalmitis. So it was probably learning curve and improvement in techniques in using small gauge vitrectomy surgery. But it, she published that in 2011 where it was shown that there's really no difference in the risk of endophthalmitis between 20 gauge and 23, 25 gauge. Um, and so we don't really feel like that's a, a real disadvantage or concern at this point in time. And then Govetto in 2013 published a meta-analysis of 148,000 cases of small gauge vitrectomy surgery compared with 20 gauge surgery. And in those 148,000 cases, there wasn't any statistically significant difference between 20 gauge and then 23 slash 25 gauge. Also, there was initially a concern about an increased risk of retinal tears or retinal detachment. And uh, that's actually turned out to not be the case either. So Nuhan published in Ophthalmologica in 2013 there were, there were actually fewer tears in cases of 23 and 25 gauge vitrectomy. So to, what do we use vitrectomy for? Well, one of the things is retinal detachments and that's outside of the scope of this talk today. But other things that we use it for are macular epiretinal membranes, vitreomacular traction, macular holes, submacular hemorrhage, and subfoveal crudal neovascularization. We hardly ever use it for subfoveal crudal neovascularization at this point in time. Uh, this is once again something that's gone by the wayside. But this is an epiretinal membrane. Most patients, the majority, will gain at least two lines of vision. Improvement in vision can continue for six to 12 months after the surgery. So this is one of those things where I really try to give the patients appropriate expectations before we go into the surgery. So I'll tell them, for instance, I'll say, this isn't gonna be like cataract surgery or LASIK. This is a much more protracted recovery time and your vision will likely get better over the course of months and months and months. And you know, nine months down the road, a year down the road, we'll really know what your maximum vision potential is after having this sort of surgery. Uh, the other rule of thumb to kind of keep in mind is that patients in general will, will get about halfway back to 2020 uh, from their surgery. So for instance, if you start with somebody who's got 2100 vision to start out with and you remove the epiretinal membrane, you would expect them to get maybe back to 2050 or 2060, but it's unlikely that they'll get back to 2020. So again, it's about setting appropriate expectations when you're signing patients up for surgery so that they don't expect it to be like cataract surgery or LASIK and come in the next day and boom, have perfect vision. Um, other, some of the risks associated with this is that nuclear sclerosis is often accelerated. So about 50% of patients who've had a vitrectomy surgery will need cataract surgery within two years. And then tears and retinal detachment are other risks in addition to endophthalmitis and hemorrhage inside of the eye. Vitreomacular traction, this is what this looks like. Symptoms include decreased vision and metamorphopsia. It can cause a shallow serous or exudative retinal detachment in the macula and often causes vision loss that's more significant than an epiretinal membrane alone. Uh, Jatria came out a few years ago. And how many of you have used or seen uh, Jatria used? Have you used Jatria? Uh, I've seen it. You've seen it? 
Did it work? Um, <laughs> kind of so-so? Yeah. <laughs> Did it release the, the vitreal macular traction? In some cases. Yeah. Yeah, so we used vit Jetria when it first came out. I don't think anybody in our clinic has done Jetria within the last couple of years. The initial success rate reported in the literature was 26%, so pretty low success rate. It's expensive. It costs $4,000 per vial of, of Jetria. They came up with some rules of thumb to keep in mind in using Jetria. One was if there's an area of epiretinal membrane or the area of traction is more than 400 microns in breadth, then Jetria probably won't work or doesn't have as good a chance of working. So typically with Jetria, you want somebody with kind of a, full, a small focal point of uh, vitreal macular traction. You don't want there to be any significant epiretinal membrane. And if you satisf satisfy those requirements, then maybe Jetria will work and would be a good option for your patient. But like I say, at $4,000 a pop, um, you can go to some surgical centers and do a vitrectomy surgery for $4,000. So it's a little bit pricey. Uh, macular holes. So stage one macular holes, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Stage four, of course, has posterior vitreous separation or posterior vitreous detachment. Stage three has the posterior hyoid still attached or intact. Um, here's an example of OCT uh, findings in each of these different types of macular hole. If a patient has a stage one macular hole, you can often observe it. You can watch it for a little while and see if it will close on its own. I've had a number of patients over the years who've had stage one macular holes that have just spontaneously resolved. So I think it's reasonable to give something like this time to see if there's spontaneous resolution. If it's a stage two macular hole, then it's a lot less likely that it's going to go away on its own and usually surgery is indicated. So typically by the time it gets to this point, you just wanna to go to the operating room because the chance of them getting spontaneous resolution is, is very low. Here's a stage three macular hole and a stage four. Actually, the posterior hyaloid doesn't look quite as detached as I might think in a stage four macular hole, but you can see it's a little bit broader, probably 500 microns or so with some edema surrounding the hole and perhaps even a little atrophy at the fovea. But uh, macular hole surgery was first described in 1991 and this was reported by Kelly and Wendell and they found a success rate of 58% by going in, removing the vitreous, peeling up your membranes and putting a gas bubble in the eye. Subsequent series have shown a success rate as high as 95%. In my experience, closure of macular holes is closer to 95% if you do the right things. And so it's thought that ILM peeling is important in the closure of macular holes or increases the success rate with macular hole surgery. So whenever I do macular hole surgery, I try to be very careful about removing the internal limiting membrane. And so I use ICG with that to make sure that I've gotten the internal limiting membrane. One thing that's kind of interesting about this is just within the last couple of years, there was a study that came out looking at size of the peeling area for the internal limiting membrane. And what they actually found out was that a larger area of ILM peel portended a poorer prognosis than just a smaller area of focal ILM peel right around the hole. Um, intraoperative dyes and stains are often used, so ICG is a very common one, as well as Tripan Blue or Brilliant Blue, and then Triamcinolone can be used. There were concerns for a while about Triamcinolone or steroids potentially decreasing the inflammatory response inside of the eye and potentially decreasing the chance that the hole would close after the surgery. That doesn't really seem to be founded and hasn't uh, been borne out in the studies. One of the concerns with ICG is toxicity. And the concern here is that when we put ICG on the macula, it can potentially be toxic to the retinal cells and the RPE cells. And in vitro, there's certainly toxicity seen with ICG. And so this is a big concern. Um, I've actually seen a couple of patients in my career who I thought had ICG toxicity. So what can you do to lower the risk of ICG toxicity in macular hole repair or epiretinal membrane peeling? Well, one of the things you can do is you can just put it on for kind of a small amount of time, a minimal amount of time. So I usually leave the ICG in the eye for about 30 seconds. And there are a couple of different ways that you can use ICG. You can mix it with dextrose so that it's heavy and it just falls back on the macula and then you can suck it out or remove it. Another way to do it is to do an air fluid exchange and then put the regular concentration of ICG in the eye and let it sit over the macula. There are pros and cons both ways, and I've kind of gone back and forth. But uh, recently there was a, an article out of Bascom Palmer that talked about the different ways of using ICG, and one of the arguments that they made was that if you 
use the heavy ICG mixed with dextrose in a macular hole, then potentially the ICG can get into the macular hole and get under the macular hole. So that's, I've usually done the air fluid exchange approach and that's what they advocated for doing macular hole surgery so that the ICG doesn't get underneath the, the uh, macula through the macular hole and potentially uh, cause toxicity for the RPE cells. So anyway, it's changed my thinking a little bit in the way I approach um, membrane peeling and ICG usage. But I usually use, I, I usually leave the ICG on the macula, uh, whichever way I do it, for 30 seconds and then take it out of the eye as completely as I can. And the other thing I do is I try not to shine light inside of the eye. So I take my light pipe out of the eye uh, while the ICG is on the retina. And one of the concerns there is there's, there's some theoretical concerns about the effect that that uh, endo illumination that light from your light pipe has on the macula in combination with the ICG, thinking that it may augment or increase toxicity. Um, another recently developed technique was this technique of ILM flap closure. So what you can do in that is you peel the ILM, but you leave a little tiny flap of ILM, and then you flop it over the macular hole. So it creates almost like a little wound closure of its own and then you put the gas in the eye and that holds that little flap in place. And that's thought to potentially produce um, better closure rates but also may decrease positioning requirements for the patient. Uh, face down positioning is, uh, is you know, really a topic of debate at this point in time. So it ranges from no face down positioning to up to four weeks of face down positioning. I usually tell my patients about five to seven days. If you put C3F8 gas in the eye or silicone oil in the eye, think that positioning requirements need to be less stringent because you're going to have a decent tamponade against the macula with C3F8 or uh, silicone oil. Nevertheless, I still have them do some positioning just because it's worked well for, for a number of years and I've had good success rates. And I, the, the last thing I ever wanna do is take a patient back to the operating room to address the same problem a second time. And so I really want them to have a successful outcome on the first surgery. How do you do it here, just in your experience working with the retina doctors here and at the VA? Do you do face down positioning? Do you recommend face down positioning for the patients? How long do you usually have them do it? Seven to 10 days. But almost everybody here still does face down positioning. You know, my, my thought on this is if you have if you say, okay, well, you don't need to do face down positioning and you have, you know, an 85% success rate with that, uh, whereas if you have them do face down positioning for a week and you have like a 98 or 99% success rate with that, why would you not have them just do the face down positioning and take care of it once and for all? Like I say, the thing that I dislike the most is having to tell somebody, look, your surgery didn't work. We've got to go back to the operating room and do the surgery again. To me, that's that's the, my, one of the least enjoyable things I have to do. So I'd rather just do it right the first time. Um, submacular surgery um, can be used for submacular hemorrhage. So if somebody has submacular hemorrhage, you can go into the eye, remove the jelly, remove the vitreous gel, and um, take a little micro cannula and create a little bleb, inject TPA in there, and then put gas in the eye, and that will help to displace the blood. I've had kind of mixed results with this and seen mixed results. I'm not convinced that it's all that effective. I usually think that anti-VEGF monotherapy is adequate, but some people are big pro proponents of displacement of the subretinal hemorrhage. And then pars plane of vitrectomy for subretinal extraction of proteal neovascularization. This was looked at as part of the submacular surgery trials, uh, or submacular surgery trial that was done 16, 17 years ago. And what they do is they make a little tiny retinotomy in the macula and then put a forcep underneath the macula and grab the portal neovascular membrane and pull it out. You have to th remember that that was in the days before anti-VEGF therapy was developed. So as a result, there weren't a lot of options for patients. They either get MPS-style MPS macular photocoagulation or they could have photodynamic therapy. Uh, photodynamic therapy was introduced while this trial was going on. So even that wasn't in wide usage at the time the trial was initiated. And so as a result of that, um, you know, th there just weren't a lot of good options. This has really fallen by the wayside. I don't think anybody has done one of these surgeries for many years. And then macular translocation. So macular translocation is where they 
cut part of the retina in the retinal periphery. They'd elevate it up with the bleb through a micro cannula and then cut the peripheral retina and they could either do part of the peripheral retina or the entire peripheral retina and then they would translocate it so they would move the retina, move the macula over healthy RPE and then put silicone oil in the eye, laser around the edge of the retina and essentially try to give the patient a new macula. Again, with the anti-VEGF therapy, this has fallen by the wayside. I don't think anybody has done macular translocation for a very long time. Um, some of the complications of diabetic retinopathy that can be addressed with partial plane of vitrectomy are vitreous hemorrhage, tractional diabetic retinal detachment, and diabetic macular edema. So when you're going into the eye, there are a couple of different approaches. You can shave down the membranes. You can try to peel the membranes. And the idea is that you want to eliminate, get all of the traction off of the macula so that the macula can lay down flat. If you've got a tractional detachment that's outside of the macula, outside of the arcades, and isn't particularly macula threatening, you can often watch those and just see how they progress, see how it evolves, because you may not need to do a vitrectomy surgery. But as the traction starts to creep inside the macula, and especially as it starts to threaten the, the fovea, you need to go to surgery and remove the traction. One of the problems that can occur is sometimes patients will develop a break in the retina, either while peeling membranes, or sometimes they'll have a break already, so they'll have a combined tractional regmatogenous detachment, which is an even more challenging situation because peeling membranes off of a mobile retina like that can be kind of tough and uh, can re result in, in more problems and complications. So anyway, the, the concept, the principle is you want to remove the membranes insofar as safely possible so that the macula will lay down flat. One of the things that one of the attendings told me when I was in my training is that he said that some, some doctors, if they're not very careful in peeling membranes, diabetic membranes off the retina and off the macula, will cause uh, golf course retinopathy. And he said that was 18 holes in the, in the retina. <laughs> and so you don't want to do that. You want to try to prevent the formation of retinal holes as you're peeling membranes off the retina. Sometimes uh, vitrectomy surgery is use useful for diabetic macular edema as well, especially if there's an epiretinal membrane that's creating a little bit of traction or if there's a very top posterior hyaloid. Sometimes anti-VEGF therapy or steroid treatment just isn't enough to get the macula to settle down and be flat. And so as a result, the best way to go is vitrectomy surgery. Uh, this is a vitrectomy surgery that I did for a few years ago for a diabetic patient. So I thought I'd just show you this video as an example of what can be done. So um, this is a 23 gauge system. You can tell by the orange uh, cannula here. And so we're just putting in the infusion line. And uh, typically with this, I like to displace the conjunctiva a little bit. Like I say, I typically go in at an angle initially and then straighten out. There's some controversy about that a little bit. Some people say, that you should just go in with an angled incision because they say if you straighten out, straighten out you can actually tear the little beveled edges and make wound closure uh, less likely or less elegant, less uh, probable. So as a result of that, um, I, I still like to go in beveled and then straighten out and I feel like I usually have good closure. Um, so just putting in the superior nasal um, cannula there. So we've got our three ports in, we've got our light pipe and our cutter. This is a patient who had, um, he had some vitreous hemorrhage, he had proliferative diabetic retinopathy, he also had diabetic macular edema. So this is the lens system that we use. This is a Volk Clairavit lens. It's a little older style lens. There are newer lenses that can be used. Uh, they don't make this particular lens anymore, but the, there's the HRX and the Avi lens and a number of different lens options. But you can see this is the hemorrhage inside of the eye that's being removed with a vitrectomy cutter. And uh, this guy had moderately dense vitreous hemorrhage but was fairly impaired by it. It really interfered with his life and what he was able to do. And to me, these cases are very gratifying because you take somebody who's, in many cases, functionally blind in that eye, you remove the blood, peel the membrane, clean things up, do laser treatment, and you essentially give that patient their vision back, which to me, like I say, is very gratifying. Uh, this patient had some blood accumulation over the posterior pole that's just sort of pooled or accumulated over the macula. So I'm essentially puffing and sucking that blood off of the macula. You can now see the optic nerve. And this is the macula. You can see some heart exudates in the macula. This is the ICG. I've done an air fluid exchange. So we're putting ICG in the eye. I've left it in place for 30 seconds. And now we're using a silicone tip extrusion cannula to remove the ICG from the eye. And then 
The next step of this is that we'll use a high magnification macula lens, so something like the Charles lens or the Mockamer lens, and we'll, uh, this patient still had a little bit of blood on the macula, so I'm using the soft tip to just uh, reflux a little bit onto the macula, causing the blood to dissipate so that I can remove the, the hemorrhage from inside of the eye and off the surface of the macula. But you can see the patient's got a number of hard uh, exudates resulting from his diabetic macular edema. And you'll see here in just a second, I've got the ILM forcep. So you can see the shadow of the ILM forcep. One of the ways you can tell how deep you are in the eye is by looking at the shadow. I mean, it's just kind of a quick and dirty way to figure out how close you are to the macula. So you put that in, you see the shadow from your light pipe, and you can tell, in this case, that we're pretty close to the macula. Uh, this is a, we're trying to grab the ILM. It's, often it's interesting, but in these patients with diabetic macular edema, you can see the little strands of ILM coming off. Often in patients with diabetic macular edema, for whatever reason, the ILM is really sticky, and so sometimes you have to do multiple grasps to get all of the ILM off of the macula. So anyway, you can see the, the membrane coming off there. And I think we're about done with that. I Sometimes we'll put a little bit of air inside of the eye. You can see the little air bubbles coming into the eye through the infusion cannula. One of the reasons to do that is it often helps with closure of the sclerotomy incisions. If you put a little air in the eye at the end of the surgery, it seems to tamponade those little flaps, the, um, uh, the beveled incisions that you make, it seems to push that incision up against the wall of the eye and just help it to close a little bit better. So here we are taking the cannulas out of the eye and no sutures, and so this is a whole lot better than what we d used to do 10 or 15 years ago. But uh, that's the end of the case on that one. So like I said, those are really gratifying surgeries because you see, um, you see almost immediate results and the next day or within a few days, they're usually very happy. Uh, pars plantar vitrectomy, or excuse me, pars plantar vitrectomy, four complications of anterior segment surgery. So this is one of those things where you're in the operating room, you're like an anterior segment surgeon, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that just happened. Call the retina surgeon. And, and so these are the types of things that the retina surgeon does to go in and manage complications of anterior segment surgery. So the first and most important one is retain lens fragments after phacal emulsification. Don't beat yourselves up about this. This happens to everybody. Here's some tips for dealing with this. Uh, don't go digging for fragments. You don't need to be macho. You don't have to be the hero. If you've got some dropped fragments that are in the posterior vitreous and not easily accessible, don't try to be the hero. I've seen doctors get into trouble. I've seen lawsuits over this. Just, if you can't get the fragments, just close up, put a lens in the eye if you can, and get out of there and send it to the retina surgeon and let the retina surgeon deal with it. These patients are gonna do fine. The only time they're not gonna do fine is if you're in there mucking around with the phaco probe or the anterior vitrectomy and you cause, um, you cause a big suprachoroidal hemorrhage or a big giant retinal tear because you've spent too much time in the eye doing things you probably shouldn't be doing. So like I say, don't feel bad about it, don't take it personally. All of you guys will have this happen to you at some point in your career, and everybody has it happen. And what will happen is you'll go down, out into practice and you'll talk to your partner and they'll say, oh, I haven't you know, had a retained lens fragment for 15 years or whatever, and just forget about that. Blow that off, don't even think about that because everybody has this happen sooner or later. And as you get more experience, it will happen less frequently. But there are people who have been out for 10, 15, 20 years, and then all of a sudden, boom, they'll have two cases of retained lens fragments. So just don't sweat it. I, I've gotta just tell you that because I know as a resident, I used to just agonize over stuff like this and was so afraid that the patient was gonna go blind and that I'd done permanent harm and that I'd really done a bad thing. And it's not that big of a deal. And the retina surgeon will actually love you for it. They'll get the business and it's a great thing for them. Um, other ways that you can use pars plantar vitrectomy for managing anterior segment, complications of anterior segment surgery. So there are dislocated intraocular lenses sometimes. There are a bunch of different ways to deal with this. Um, eight million ways and counting, I think. But I've tried a bunch of different ones. You can glue the lens, you can suture the lens, you can put it in an ACI well. You can, I, the, uh, just a couple days ago, I scleral fixated a lens um, with a suture. The challenge with suture is it seems like there are a lot of gymnastics. I mean, just getting the lens in the right position, getting it to center, I, it can be kind of a tough thing. Cystoid macular edema, you try topical meds first and then subtenons or intravitreal steroids. And if all else fails, you can go to vitrectomy with ILM peeling. 
Um, Supercroidal hemorrhage and needle penetration of the globe are bad complications, but you know, once again, just get them to the retina surgeon and let the retina surgeon deal with that. Postoperative endophthalmitis, we'll have to go through this kind of quickly, but it's usually, uh, if it's less than six weeks in duration, it's considered to be acute onset. The most common type of uh, postoperative endophthalmitis is coag negative staph, and usually this is causes kind of a mild to moderate endophthalmitis. Streptococcus species, in my experience, causes horrible endophthalmitis. This is eye-melting endophthalmitis. Most of the cases I've seen of streptococcal endophthalmitis, the patient loses their vision, they go blind, and often end up with a tysicle eye. I've seen a couple salvaged, but th these are really hard cases. Gram-negative uh, is kind of a mixed bag. Bacillus can be really bad. Sometimes it's fairly mild. If it's beyond six weeks, then it's chronic. Usually this is due to P. acnes, coag-negative staph, uh, fun fungi can cause this as well as neoplasia, so just kind of be on the lookout for lymphoma. And then bleb associated ophthalmology or endophthalmitis is often streptococcus caused, and so once again, terrible eye melting endophthalmitis. You've got to jump on those fast, and often doing a, a prompt vitrectomy is appropriate. One of the things to keep in mind is toxic anterior segment syndrome, and so that was described by Dr. Mamelis here at the University of Utah. And usually this has a rapid onset within 12 to 24 hours, limbus to limbus corneal edema, increased pressure. Vitreous inflammation is usually absent. These patients usually don't have a hypopian. To me, the hypopian or a hypopian is kind of the hallmark sign of endophthalmitis. If you see a hypopian, you think endophthalmitis. If you're not sure, treat them with steroids and watch them closely. I did a vitrectomy on my neighbor a few months ago and I have not had a case of postoperative endophthalmitis in my career since being out of fellowship, but this neighbor of mine a few months ago got postoperative endophthalmitis. He lives across the street from me, it was terrible. But he came in, he said, my eyes red, it hurts, and I can't see. And so he came in at noon and he didn't really have much of a hypopian, I wasn't sure. And I said, well, I, I think you might, but I'm not sure, so let's bomb you with steroids, it could just be postoperative inflammation. I hit him with steroids every hour, had him come back that night at 6 or 7 p.m., and he had a little hypopian for me and was worse. He definitely was not better, so I said, you've got endophthalmitis, we're doing a tap and inject. But like I say, if you need to, just watch them closely, hit them with steroids and see how it goes. But you've got to be meticulous. You can't hit them with steroids and say, come back next week, because if they come back next week, there may not be anything to salvage. Um, the endophthalmitis vitrectomy uh, study was published in 1995. It looked at doing vitrectomy versus tap and inject. If a patient is light perception or worse, then you do a vitrectomy. If their hand motions are better, then you do a tap and inject. They also looked at intravenous antibiotics in this study. They used, um, let's see, they used ceftazidime and amikacin. They found that intravenous antibiotics weren't beneficial, but with fourth generation fluoroquinolones, they actually penetrate really well into the vitreous. This was shown um, by Dr. Uh, Hari Prasad um, at the University of Chicago and, and actually get very good levels of moxifloxacin in the vitreous and anterior chamber. And so in some cases of more severe endophthalmitis, it's probably worth using oral moxifloxacin and you get just as good a levels with oral moxifloxacin as you would with intravenous treatment. Um, this is just kind of the technique for tap and inject. And then for chronic, you usually want to do a vitrectomy. Bleb associated is bad. Um, like I say, get them right in, do a tap and inject, possibly a vitrectomy, but you have to be very aggressive with bleb associated endophthalmitis. And that's the end. Thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you coming out. Any questions? Okay, awesome. Thank you.